is a comfort to my soul. Your word is the truth that sets me free. Your word. Well, hi there, and welcome once again to In Search of Christianity, brought to you by Bible Talk. And on behalf of everybody that's involved in the ministry of Bible Talk, I want to welcome you to these studies as we continue on in our look at the letter of James. And now, I, this is the 14th week we've been in here, and uh, we're in the fifth chapter, and we'll be starting in verse 5 of James. All right? All right. <clears throat> but before we do that, let me first do this. Father, we just pray that you, God, would put a guard over my mouth, that nothing would come out of my mouth that you've not put into my heart. Oh, yeah. Lord, that, that all of our ears would be open to you and to your word. Lord, that we might grow in our knowledge of you and our knowledge of your love for us and your love for others. Lord, help us to be that people of love, putting love into action all the time. Love and faith, Lord God, love and faith. Oh, yeah. So we praise you and thank you for this time together. And we just ask your blessing and anointing upon it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Right, as I said, we're starting off in James chapter 5, and we had left off last week having read verses 1 through 4. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to pick up in verse 5. Now I'm going to read verses 5 and 6. Okay. And remember, I, I, want to, I have to say this again. This letter of James is a very strong and powerful letter. It's very challenging, so please don't be afraid to be challenged. Open your hearts. James 5 and 6. You have lived luxuriously on the earth and led a life of wanton pleasure. You have fattened your heart in a day of slaughter. You have condemned and put to death the righteous man. He does not resist you. You've lived luxuriously on the earth. That's been very comfortably. Abundantly comfortably. Mm -hmm. I mean, to be in luxury means to have an absolute abundance and just be in that place, right? Uh, and James is saying, to these people who, uh, to uh, God's spirit should speak, right. that they have sought and lived luxuriously on earth. You know, Jesus lived luxuriously. He lived an abundant life. In heaven. He loved, yes. in, in heaven, he lived, uh, he, I mean, he's, he's there in the throne room with the God the Father, with the angels and all the glory of God, right? There's nothing better than that. There's nothing better than that. Nothing to compare on earth, what's the, in heaven. But God had a ministry for him. Yes, he did. So he sent him to be born on earth. Mm -hmm. So think about that. And I'm going to read from Philippians chapter 2. I'm going to read verses 5 through 8, right? Have this attitude, this mind in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself taking the form of a bondservant and being born in the likeness of men and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Jesus came down from the throne room of the Father. He left that luxury. Yes. <laughs> he left that place that was so deservedly his and came to earth you know, he said, I, 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 he said in John chapter 6, he said, For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Jesus, his time on earth was fixed on one thing, doing the will of the Father. So leaving the glory, the absolute luxury of heaven, to be born in an animal's feeding trough in Bethlehem. Think about that. And think about what Paul said, have the same mind, the same attitude in yourselves, which was in Christ Jesus. Mm. Consider that. Give it some thought. Contemplate it. Those who have lived luxuriously on earth and led a life of wanton pleasure are obviously... You're back in chains? Yeah, yeah. Okay. They're obviously not those Christians who have heard and acted upon what Jesus lived and taught in the Sermon on the Mount about being poor in spirit. Right. Blessed are the poor in spirit. About me denying yourself, about dying to yourself, about picking up your cross and following him, right? The instruction of God's word to us is to have the same mind in us that was in Christ Jesus. Obviously, not to seek riches. And Jesus had said in Matthew 6, 19, 
Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. So in faith, we are to be encouraged by that cloud of witnesses who gain God's approval, including Moses, right? Mm -hmm. And it says in Hebrews 11, I'm going to read verses 24, 5, and 6. By faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing, rather, to endure ill treatment with the people of God and to enjoy the passing, passing pleasures of sin, considering the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures of Egypt, for he's, he was looking to the reward. You know, we need to be looking to the reward. We need to, to have our minds set on the things above. We need to fix our eyes on Jesus Christ. We have to be heavenly minded. Well, Moses was able to do that because what it says in Numbers 12, 3 is, Now the man Moses was very humble, more than any man who was on the face of the earth. Are you humble? Well, it's going to be the humble. Well, let's see the face of God, I'm telling you. So then where did this prosperity message, this prosperity gospel, that's so evident in the church today, where did it come from? I mean, it permeates so much of the church. And so, it, and it was even presented to Jesus. Well, I, I'll get that. Yeah. Let me. I want to make one thing clear first of all. All right, it's not money or having money that's the problem. No, it is the love of money, because it says in First Timothy six ten, for the love of money is a root of all sorts of evil, and some by longing for it have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. So you have to learn the mystery that Paul learned. Paul, who penned these very words, these beautiful words about the mind of Christ here in Philippians that we just read, mm -hmm. he said, I know how to get along with humble means, and I also know how to live in prosperity. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of being filled and going hungry, both of having abundance and suffering need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Philippians 4, verses 12 and 13. You see, it's not about having abundance. It's about the desire. It's, about the, it's not about having money. It's about the desire for money. It's surely a question, really a question, of whether or not you will serve God or serve that harsh taskmaster, that evil taskmaster that Jesus called mammon, wealth, mm -hmm. in the Sermon on the Mount, chapter 6. Remember, Jesus said in, in Matthew 6, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And he said, no one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he'll be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. That was Matthew 6, 21 and 24. You know, when Jesus had the temptation, the trial of temptation in the wilderness, at the beginning of his ministry, the devil tried, first of all, to get him. I mean, the devil tried three things, right? Mm -hmm. When the first two didn't work, he pulled out the big guns. Mm -hmm. Really? I mean, stop yes. and think about this. He went after the, he had failed to try and get Jesus to act on his physical need, hunger. Mm -hmm. He had failed to get Jesus to act on his pride. Now he tries the big thing. And he says, again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the earth and their glory. And he said to Jesus, all these things I will give you if you fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, go Satan, get thee behind me Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Matthew 4, chapter, chapter 4, verses eight to 10, right? I don't know, most of you are probably not old enough to remember this, but there was a movie back in the 1980s. Uh, it was an Oscar-winning movie, by the, by the way, called Wall Street. Oh, yeah. The same message that came forth from that, that movie, Wall Street, mm -hmm. is coming forth from pulpits all over, yes. all over the Western world, for sure. And that message was, greed is good. Gordon Gekko, the, the protagonist in this thing, he says, greed is good. Of course, God says, greed is idolatry. Which one are you gonna choose? That's what it says, Colossians 3, 5, greed is idolatry. 
you've got to choose who you're going to serve. Jesus said this. I mean, it's clear. He said, no man can serve two masters. But the fact of the matter is you're going to serve, you're going to choose to serve one. And you can't serve both of them at the same time. Mm -hmm. So let me move right along to verses 7 and 8 here in James 5. Therefore be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. The farmer waits for the precious produce of the soil, being patient about it until it gets the early and late rains. You too be patient. Strengthen your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is near. Amen. Hallelujah to that. Even so, come Lord Jesus. So be patient. The wonderful fruit of the Holy Spirit, translated its long-suffering in the King James, mm -hmm. at patience, means to endure, to persevere. And it says, as, as they heard these things, he added and spoke a parable because he was nigh unto Jerusalem and because they thought that the kingdom of God should immediately appear. He said, therefore, a certain noble man went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. And he called his ten servants and delivered them ten pounds and said unto them, Occupy, do business, till I come. That's Luke 19, verse 11 and thir through 13. Now, once again, that is not that's not at all the now faith sermon of all too many prosperity preachers or of the immediate gratification of the marketing minds that have shaped our modern culture. Right. It's about you got to have it now. You got to have it now. That's that's the opposite of patience. Patience is the fruit of the spirit. It's the total opposite. I mean, I love this song. Well, you know, we've sung it many times. I, I am a poor wayfaring stranger. Mm -hmm. We're just passing through this world. We should have no attachment to this world other than the calling of God as to represent him as ambassadors for Christ. To be that people who brings the knowledge of the presence of Christ Jesus into every place. Yes, the things of earth should be continually growing dim in our lives. Well, because it says, set your mind on the things above. That's right. And it says in Hebrews 6.15, And so, having patiently waited, he, this is talking about Abraham, mm -hmm. obtained the promise. Having patiently waited, he received the promise. And, and because of that, I mean, thus, a thousand years before James and David, David had written, I would have despaired unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and let your heart take courage. Yes, wait for the Lord. At Psalm 27, verses 13 and 14. That's patience. Wait for the Lord. The spirit and the bride say come. We should have a burning desire for the Lord to come. Mm. But we should also make recognize the fact he's Lord. That's right. He'll come at the right time, I promise Absolutely. you that. So it says, the spirit and the bride say come, and let the one who hears say come. And let the one who is thirsty come. Let the one who wishes to take the water of life without mm. cost. He who testifies to these things says, yes, I am coming quickly. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. That's Revelation chapter 22, verses 17 and 20. So, like a farmer who not does not want to get seed into the ground real early in the day so he'll have food for breakfast tomorrow. Well, really. Yeah. We're called to cultivate faithfulness. That's right. And cultivation is a process. And it can be, you know what, it's a process that God has set a time for, no matter what the crop is. Mm -hmm. Have patience. Don't be saying, you know, can you wait just a minute? Yeah. <laughs> no. Now in that verse it says, strengthen your hearts. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or tremble at them. For the Lord your God is the one who goes with you. He will not fail you or forsake you. That's Deuteronomy 31, 6. Be strong and courageous. Strengthen your hearts. And again in Joshua, God spoke to Joshua as they're coming out and headed for the promised land. And he said, only be strong and very courageous. Be careful to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. And do not turn to it, turn it from it to the right or to the left, so that you may have success wherever you go. Joshua 1.7. And I'm going to go on and read from Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah. He said, for thus the Lord spoke to me with mighty power. And instructed me not to walk in the way of this people, saying, You are not to say it is a conspiracy in regard to all this people call a conspiracy, 
and you are not to fear what they fear or be in dread of it. You hear a lot of conspiracy yes. stuff today, don't you? Oh my goodness. It is the Lord of hosts whom you should regard as holy, and he shall be your fear, and he shall be your dread. Isaiah 8, 11 to 13. I'm telling you what, he's near. So the battle's on. You gotta protect your heart. Yes. You have to, you have to protect your heart. Now remember, I made this opening statement a couple of weeks ago when we were talking about in James chapter five. Mm -hmm. This is a strong, a very strong message from James, but it's about faith and love, yes. okay? So think of what Paul wrote to the Ephesians. I'm sure you know this. Therefore, take up the full armor of God so that you'll be able to resist in the evil day and having done all, everything, to stand firm Stand firm, therefore, having girded your loins with truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness. Have you ever read about the whole armor of God? The breastplate of righteousness. But Paul, who wrote that, also wrote to the church at Thessalonica. And he said, but since we are of the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. First Thessalonians 5.8. You know what? Scripture interprets Scripture. The breastplate of righteousness is also, indeed, the breastplate of faith and love. Because faith and love are what righteousness is all about. That's right. Okay? you got to get that. You've got to understand that that's what protects your heart. What protects your heart is walking in faith. The, what, it's walking in faith and love. you got to have the two of those together, right? You know what? I, I pray that when you hear these Bible studies, you will speak these Bible studies to yourself and you will talk to the Lord about them. Mm. Because it's not what comes from me that's going to change anything in your life. It's what you hear from the Holy Spirit. That's why I say test all things. Test what I say. Check it out. Make sure it's the Word of God. And if it's the Word of God, you better obey. Yes. So let me go to the ninth verse, James 5, 9. Do not complain, brethren, against one another, so that you yourselves may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing right at the door. In everything give thanks, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. That's what it says in 1 Thessalonians 5. But encourage one another day after day as long as it's still called today, so that none of you will be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. Hebrews 3.13. This is the life we're supposed to lead. We're supposed to be not complaining. We're supposed to be not grumbling and complaining. We're supposed to be giving thanks. We're supposed to be encouraging one another. You know, the, the Western culture has been trained by the word, world, not by the word. The, the, the Western culture has been trained by the world to be able to love and hate the same thing at the same time. Mm. A company that manufactures car, a car that you own wants you, and they want you to love it so they can retain your loyalty. At the same time, they have to create discontent with that car so that you're compelled to purchase a newer model from them. Right. I was in the advertising business before I got saved. I was in the advertising business before I got saved. I know that's a, that's a truth and it's, it's hard to understand that. But remember, the first revelation of the serpent in the Bible is in Genesis 3.1 that he was more subtle, more crafty than any other beast of the field. So in James 5.10, I'm going to move right along. It says, as an example, brethren, of suffering and patience, take the prophets in the name of the Lord, who spoke in the name of the Lord. And, and Stephen, mighty and faithful brother, said in Acts chapter 7, verse 52, which one of those prophets did your fathers not persecute? They killed those who had previously announced the coming of the righteous one, those betrayers, whose betrayers and murderers you have now become. And then... It says in Revelation 19, verse 10, Then I fell at his feet to worship him. This is an angel. But he said to me, Do not do that. I am a fellow servant of yours and your brethren who hold the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. It's not about what God's going to give you. It's not about a new car. It's not about a new job. It's about the testimony of Jesus Christ. And then he goes on in Revelation chapter 20 and he says, Then I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and the judgment was given to them. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony of Jesus, 
and because of the word of God. And those who had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received the mark on their foreheads and on their hand, they came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. There is a reward waiting at the end of the day, at the end of the trip, all right? And Jeremiah, this is Jeremiah 35, 15. Also, I have sent to you all my servants and the prophets, sending them again and again, saying, Turn now every man from his evil way and amend your deeds and do not go after other gods to worship them. Then you will dwell in the land which I have given to you and to your forefathers, but you have not inclined your ear or listened to me. How many times he had to say that? He sent the prophets. Yeah. The question is, the people of God rarely wanted to listen to what the prophets had to say. How about you? How about me? Mm -hmm. are, we, are we desiring to hear the word of God from the prophets? All right, James 5.11, I'm zipping right along here. We count those blessed who endured. You have heard of the endurance of Job and have seen the outcome of the Lord's dealings, that the Lord is full of compassion and is merciful. Now, at the end of this letter, we're going to go full service, full circle. Mm -hmm. Because remember, back in the beginning, James said, James 1, Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, mm -hmm. knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance, and let endurance have its perfect result, so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Hallelujah. That's God's purpose. Mm -hmm. He's molding us and shaping us. He is working perfection in us. And how does he do that? Through trials and tribulations, and through our endurance and giving thanks in the midst of them. Remember that Job was a righteous man, and the Lord, according to his promise, was transforming him. And it says in 2 Corinthians 3, 18, But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as from the Lord the Spirit. Oh. We're being transformed. Praise God. You know what? You, you're going to look more like Jesus at the end of this day than you did at the beginning of this day if you're, if you're walking in, in, in faith and love and the Word. And, okay. and at the last, we will be like Him. We when we him. see Him as He is, we will be as He is. Yes. And the most magnificent promise there in Romans chapter 8 is whom He has foreknown, He has predestined to become conformed into the image of His Son, Christ Jesus. We're going to look just like Jesus. That's Hallelujah. The, the great unveiling. We no longer see dimly Amen. through a mirror. So let me read uh, 512, James 512. But above all, my brethren, do not swear, either by heaven or by earth, or with any other oath. But your yes is to be yes, and your no, no, so that you may not fall under judgment. We're to be imitators of God as beloved children. So imitate this. The Lord said to me, you have seen well, for I am watching over my word to perform it. That's what he said to Jeremiah, Jeremiah 1, 12. I'm, you've seen well, I'm watching over my word to perform it. That word, that Hebrew word for word is debar, which by the way means promise. Okay? And it means word. It's the same, same word, word and promise. Because any word that God speaks is a promise. Any promise that God makes is his word. All right? It says, Thy word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Psalms 119, 105. And it also says in Joshua 21, 45, There failed not any good thing which the Lord has spoken mm. unto the house of Israel. All came to pass. Where was that? That's Joshua 21. That was 45, right? Mm. Okay, I, I, I'm going to end on this because, uh, but I don't want to miss it. In James 5.13, it says, Is anyone among you suffering? Then he must pray. Yeah. Is anyone cheerful? He is to sing praises. Hallelujah. Yes. Is it either suffer and pray, or be cheerful and sing praises? Or is it both? Both. Because think about this in Philippi. Mm -hmm. All right? Yes. I'm going to read from Philippians chapter, uh, from Acts. This is what happened in Philippi. In Acts 16, I'm going to read verses 23, 24, and 25, talking about Paul and Silas. When they had struck them with many blows, they threw them into prison, mm -hmm. commanding the jailer to guard them securely. And he, having received such a command, 
threw them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. But about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns of praise to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. Do you think they were suffering? They just got beaten unjustly and unlawfully, by the way, and thrown into the deepest, darkest part of a Roman prison. Not nice. Were they suffering? It's horrible. They were. Were they praying? Absolutely. But it also says, think about this, right? Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns of praise to God. They were doing both. You need to do both. When everything's going wrong, you need to be praying. You need to be praising God. You need to be singing praises to Amen. God. That's where the victory lies. Right? So I'll, I'll let this be a little homework for you for the week. Go read Isaiah chapter 42. Amen. See what the real battle plan is. And I'm telling you, you need to be a we need we need to be a people of praise. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, it's like the Amalekites in the wilderness when the Jews first the Hebrews first came out of the bondage, came through the Red Sea, and they were attacked by the Amalekites. It talks about the fact that Moses was up on a mountain looking down on them, and whenever he raised his hands, praising God, the enemy was being defeated. Right. Can it get tired? Well, you know, God sent her and Aaron to help Moses hold up his hands. For the victory to be won. Praise. There's when you're in, power in yeah. praise. When you're in a battle with the enemy, make sure that you are both doing both. You're praying and praising God and it's giving thanks. That just reminded me of the, the three. It's power and prayer and praise. The three Ps. <laughs> and there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. Power and Prayer and praise. Thank you, Lord. Well, it, it is. It's victory. We have already won the victory. The enemy has already been defeated. Satan is not going to be defeated. No. He's defeated. Satan was displayed as being defeated when Jesus was publicly displayed on the cross. That's why we need to rejoice. The victory is over. over. The victory is done. Yeah. I mean, the battle is done. Jesus the... won. Hallelujah. And that means that you won. Amen. So I, I, we thank you, Father. Yes, we do. We thank you, Lord God, that you have won the battle, that you came and you fought the fight for us. You fought the good fight. Thank you, Lord. Lord, that you have done for us what we never do be able to do for ourselves. Yes, we can be strong in the strength of your might, Lord, and your spirit, but you already defeated the enemy. You defeated the enemy when you put your son, Jesus Christ, on that cross to take away the stain of sin from our lives. Thank you, Jesus. So, Lord, help us to rejoice. Help us to be that people of praise that you formed us to be. And, Lord, help us to declare your praises from the coastland, Lord God, to sing praises unto you. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. I sing praises unto you. Oh, Lord, praises unto you. Oh, Lord, for your name is great and greatly to be praised. I sing praises to your name, O oh Lord, praises to your name, O oh Lord, for your name is great and greatly to be praised. Hallelujah. Thank you, Thank Jesus. You. Thank you for joining us. And I pray that you would remember to praise God throughout the week. In the good times, in the bad times, in the attacks, and in the peace. Be a people of praise that he's formed you to be. Hallelujah. Declare his praise. Declare the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Praise well, until next week when we'll pick up here in James, and I think probably we'll finish up in James next week. Probably. Probably. God willing. Pray for us. And if you have prayer requests, send them to us at BibleTalk.com. Thank you, Jesus. And we'd be happy to be praying for you and, and what you, what God has put on your heart. Yes. Well, till then, may the Lord our God bless you, keep you, and just use you for the glory of his name. Praise the Lord. Amen and goodbye. Bye.